Rock The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Rock Pile Report podcast. I'm your host, Bills season ticket holder, Drew Gear. That's my producer, Chris Krueger. And we're here talking about another week of Bill's training camp. Dude, hold, hold up. Hold up there. How was your, uh, do you have any issues yesterday? Because I'd love to discuss what a dumpster fire the roadway and infrastructure is in around Tonawanda. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the news. No, I but did not. I tend to work in that area. So, for those that don't know, tornado in Buffalo, heavy downpour. Sheridan and uh, I think Colvin in Tonawanda was like standing three feet of water, <laughs> which is not surprising because Tonawanda is the. It's the trashiest spot <laughs> in Buffalo that they can't even do. Like basic they, infrastructure projects don't exist there. They can't do Dra- they can't drainage. Do yeah, drainage. You know, back in our day, they're talking about they're talking about medieval Rome. They're like, we just dump things out the window. Bah. We don't need drainage. What are we talking about? There is standing water everywhere in Tonawanda yesterday because of that storm. Like it, even when I walked out of work, like there are people on the loading docks. Like, oh, I'm just gonna wait for this to pass before I walk out to my car because we have to like walk through a, a security spot, and people aren't gonna stand in line to walk through security. So I'm that does, none of that phased me. I'm in the parking lot. I'm ankle deep in water <laughs> I my shoes were soaking wet Tonawanda can't get their shit together guys here's a hilarious factoid there was yesterday was that Monday the 5th of August yesterday there was exactly one tornado that touched down in the entire continental US this will be a, like a trivia thing someday like August 5th, 2024, one tornado touched down somewhere in the United States. Where was it? No one will guess Buffalo, New York. Not a single person will guess downtown Buffalo, New York. Ah, This is the Chris. It's the end of days, brother. What a way to go. (laughs) Sit in a basement, chugging Utica Club, talking about Buffalo Bills football. I took my kids to the blue and red scrimmage this past weekend. It was awesome. Oh, so, the- dude, we, you and I had, and by text exchange, I mean no text exchanges <laughs> at all because <laughs> Friday you had the, you took your, I text you about the show this week, Friday night. I think Jessica and I were at, we went to Sunny Reds for uh, wings. I went to which, Sunny Red for wings Saturday night. Okay, there we go. Because, I text you. Sunny Red's unofficial sponsor of the uh, Rock Power Report podcast, or at least our alcoholism. Exactly. But I texted you Friday night about the show, heard nothing from you on Friday night. And I was like, oh, Drew's at Blue and Red. He's not going to text me back. And then it's like Saturday. I'm like, what the fuck is going? I'm like, (laughs) backyard barbecue throwdown. He's in Lancaster judging food. State competition. Yeah. And then Sunday, you know, you fast forward to Sunday, uh, brother comes in from Ohio, family party at mom's house, gone again. I don't think I texted you until Sunday night. Something like that. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to look. So, blue and red scrimmage. And it was a great time. Not that I really get to see much of the practice, but I didn't really care. That's not what I'm there for. Like, I, I've watched too many of these things. I really the the reason for being there was taking my four and two year old and getting to show them the stadium, letting them walk around the concourse and yell the shout song and see how, if they go, Hey, hey, hey there's at least 20 people who are going to yell it back to you and watching them get a kick out of that. You know, just being like, Hey, do you see that up there? Those are daddy's seats. See where it says Jack Kemp. I sit right underneath that. Like, 
giving them context to where their father disappears to every single Sunday for you know every other Sunday for half a year. You should show them where your father disappeared to. <laughs> Elusive like Bigfoot. No one knows. <laughs> we'd have to make a whole we'd have to make a whole series about that, Chris. Yeah. Please no. don't fight me, Dave Gear. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a, it's just a joke. He's going to beat your ass one of these days and it's I'm I'm telling you I'm here for it. I'll sell tickets. The practice was a lot of fun. I mean, the weather, it wasn't even really that wet. I didn't bring a jacket. It was cool. I got some awesome pictures of my kids just being cute, just being in the stadium. The the Snapdragon, Chris, you ever heard of Snapdragon Apples? They're a sponsor of the Buffalo Bills. And Reed Ferguson. And our friend Reed Ferguson. I've got a picture of my kid who just like, they gave him a sticker. And then the mascots out there. And my son not only goes and gives the dragon a hug, but then gives him the sticker that they just handed him. Like, here you have this. He's a sweet kid. I don't know where he gets it from. It was cool. And the little bit of practice we did get to see was fantastic because there's a moment, right? There's a moment Josh Allen just wires a pass. And there's a kid, a couple, I didn't even realize it, a couple rows in front of us who has his shirt off and is just held like Petey Pablo style, whipping around his head like a helicopter. And my son, without missing a beat, just has his shirt off and has the most intense look on his face. And he's just fist pumping and the music's going and he's getting into it. And I had to just sit there and I was like, you know, I got to record this for posterity. And I sent everyone agreed. The apple did not fall that far from the tree. Chris, it was that's the moment that really got me. It wasn't Daquan Hardy's interception. It wasn't the <laughs> it wasn't any of the you know, it wasn't the defense executing well on the defensive line. It was my son shirtless going ham after a play, yelling go bills at the top of his lungs with this look of just like intensity on his face at the age of four, where I'm like, yeah, <laughs> this brought a tear to my eye. I thought you were going to say you had to shave his back <laughs> like you going shirtless. So as we're here kind of recapping what was the week and just some of our takeaways as we head into what is what is the final week of training camp before everything breaks and the preseason really gets going. Here's some quick hits right off the top. First of all, I'm going to raise this cold Utica club and I want to give a toast to the Justin Shorter gang. You guys tried, you fought valiantly, and now it's all over but the crying. Is he, uh, I mean, I don't pay attention to these things like you do because I like to sit back here and press the buttons and make sure everything gets recorded. Is he, is he passed by Hamler and, uh, who's it, Tyrell Shavers? Shaver, do, is, he, is he passed, he's passed been, by by them? He's not only been passed, but at this point, with his lack of NFL experience and just the fact that, again, nagging little things, dinged up here, a couple drops there, mostly unremarkable play, like, that's the biggest curse, isn't it? Just, like, it's one thing to show up to training camp and be bad. It's another thing to show up and just not be mentioned at all. You're just a wholly unremarkable football player. And that's okay, because honestly, that's where most guys coming out of college end up. You end up hitting the NFL level, being wholly unremarkable, and getting cut. Are you telling me he is the new Isaiah Hodgins? Injury I, takes takes over his uh, his game there? Mm-hmm. I don't even know that Hodgins was that injured. I just don't think that they, I think they looked at him and Gabe Davis and said, we think Gabe Davis is better. Now, Hodgins has had his moments in the NFL, but where was he last year? Chris, you want to give that a goog? What was his, what was Isaiah Hodgins stat line last season? Because all the hype and all of the slander that got thrown around about how the bills let him go. And this is a travesty. I want to know what his 2023 was like. Well, you gotta, you gotta, let the people know he had Daniel Jones throwing him the ball. Not exactly ideal. 
Okay. So in 2023, look, but look, 2022, he leaves Buffalo, goes to the Giants, starts five games, has 351 yards and four touchdowns. And everyone goes, oh my God, he's great. We suck for letting him walk. Chris, what was his stat line for all of 2023? 230 yards, uh, 21 receptions on 33 targets, and three touchdowns. Not ideal at all. He had 12, 12 first downs. It's almost like they, like everyone realized, hey, that guy's not good. We just need to press him a little bit. And he disappeared. Because that's what happens to average players. You get figured out. And unfortunately, Justin Shorter is one of these guys who I just don't think I think it's the wrong mix of health and just your skill set isn't anything special. Being tall is not a skill set. It's a thing that can allow your existing skill set to flourish. If you're tall and you have good hands, if you're tall and you have a big catch radius and you just have a natural feel for how to track a ball over your shoulders, then yeah, that's a realistically Justin Shorter has probably like I wouldn't be shocked if this isn't a thing where when his contract like do you even like you're gonna cut him at the at the deadline you're not gonna roster him practice squad maybe maybe but if you think that Andy Isabella might be able to come back at some point don't you leave some more if he's injured and there's worry about depends on the injury and you're gonna cut him or you're going to put him on some, give him some sort of injury designation. Why would you do that? Like, there's got to be other guys. That's how far he's fallen down the ladder. And it's unfortunate, but it's over, I think. Also, reports of Ray Davis getting stuffed at the goal line. (laughs) Oh, people were mad about this one. It'll obviously be revisionist history, but I remember being salty about the Buffalo Bills passing on running back Braylon Allen out of Wisconsin, allowing the New York Jets to take him so that they could draft what they, th- I believe, well, what they firmly believe is the more well-rounded talent in Ray Davis. I understand. I'm not, I'm not, Chris, I think we've proven I'm not a GM. <laughs> you should never be a GM. This guy who, Braylon Allen, who was a draft crush of a lot of Bills fans, I think that this preseason is going to be really integral for him getting off the ground, especially with Ty Johnson still nursing that injury. And I think that he's gotten a lot of looks. It is a little disappointing to hear that he's not. Everyone's like, oh, no, he's a super physical runner and he can do this and he can do that. And then I hear reports that like, I, like I've been hearing out of camp, like Joe Biscali, you're writing about him. And talking about him getting stuffed at the goal line and just the way that it happened. And he goes, he doesn't run with the physicality that we were sold. And all I can think of is Zach Moss. And I go, did we just Zach Moss this again? No, that's not to say Zach Moss. Like, he just went on to prove he has ability. Right? He had a great season for the Colts until uh, Jonathan Taylor really kind of took the reins back. Didn't he? Was he not injured? Who? Uh, Zach Moss with Indi- I'll pull that up. Injured where? In Indianapolis. No, he, he goes- just left. He just left and went to the Bengals. Really? That's yeah. He just left and went to the Bengals. That's how much I care about him. <laughs> so it's it's a little disappointing to hear that again because you think about the d- draft picks, Chris, that have been spent at running back. I did this exercise the other night where I took a look, and let me even see if I saved it. Did I save it? Holy crap, that'd be funny if I did. I was half awake when I did this. So I took the – and if you go to Pro Football Reference and you look at uh, Bill's draft history, it shows you every draft pick we've ever made. And the thing that I look at is how many times Brandon Bean has actually drafted running backs. We've never used a premium pick on one, which has been flirted with. But what we have done is we've spent – a third round pick and another third round pick and a second round pick. And I think that you would assume that over a long enough timeline, one of those guys would have gone on to like move the needle in some way, shape or form. Now cook looks like he could be that player, but at the same time, like Devin Singletary was okay. 
He wasn't great. He does, feasted on light boxes. Something it? no one, no Singletary truther will ever admit. He feasted on light boxes. Doesn't our uh, friend of the show, Matt Waldman, often refer to as like drafting running backs being the cherry to your Sunday? Yeah. You, you need your, your ice cream, which I would assume would be the was me and food analogies again. The ice cream would be like the offensive line, sprinkles being the quarterback and wide receivers, and then cherry on top is that premium running back. So my thing is I'm going to be salty when I hear that Braylon Allen comes out here in the preseason and they don't let Brees Hall run over there in New Jersey. And Braylon Allen has some monster plays and that he scores touchdowns in the preseason and then I hear reports that, well, Ray Davis and the short yardage stuff, he's not really he doesn't run as hard as we thought he would. <laughs> his his physical running style is more of a we got to adapt it. It's more of a Damian Harris type thing where he's going to run with a little physicality, but we it's more savvy than that. And he but he had some pass catching and that's nice. And he's going to be more of this like all around player than a hammer, which is what I think people thought we needed. And I I will admit, I will be salty when I hear it. That doesn't mean anything for us, though. So all the people who are overreacting to the goal line stuffs of Ray Davis, don't sit here and act like Josh Allen isn't just going to vulture every single goal line touchdown. He scored 15 rushing touchdowns last year. 15 of them. And yes, a handful of them were from distance. Like the Chris, the Steelers game. Yeah, the Steelers game, that long, just breakaway running touchdown. And I remember, I think it was NFL Turning Point. You ever seen those videos? I've seen them. They go back and they're showing like players. It had to be the Steelers game. I'm pretty sure I'm right about this because it was an NFL Turning Point video. And they're talking about, they're showing the the defense being like, yeah, man, we got them. We got this. We just got to, you know, we're going to get back on the field. Get, get the ball back. The offensive linemen are pumped up. They're like, all right, we're going to get into the crack at this thing. And then Josh Allen just takes off and you watch it just suck the life out of everybody. And the linemen are like, damn. Oh, that's a, that's a bitch. fake slide, right? In the playoffs, the fake slide. No, I don't think it was that. Not that one of the best plays ever. Fakes looked like Allen was going to fake a slide and he kept going. I don't need Ray Davis to be the most physical running back on earth. I don't. I think at all that's overrated. I do need to see him be an effective running back. You need to show that you're decisive between the tackles. You can't dance around. I need to see you get outside when you can. And I need to see that your hands work when we decide to throw you the ball. You do those things. There's space for you on this roster. But I think that he has to have it. He has to prove that he has a little more juice because otherwise Ty Johnson looked good last year, didn't he? He did. If you looked, if you were looking for a north-south runner, Ty Johnson, they know what he is. And Ty Johnson knows what he is. And he's done it at the NFL level. I think that this preseason is really Ray Davis's to run away with. If he can, if he has the chops, I'm interested to see as an older running back, you know, whereas Braylon Elm is a relatively young running back. I wonder if the age really does translate to success. I think the way the Bills front office thought it might. Now, Chris, we caught a lot of flack for all the uh, Gable Stevens and slander. In fact, I have a DM from Greg Thompson. I was just about to say, I <laughs> saw that DM and it was amazing. Like you're all the rage in the cover one Slack channel and how much you hate him. What I love is that people are talking about my disdain for this player inside the cover one chat. And immediately Greg goes, Greg's response to all of the people talking about like, oh no, Drew's gone on multiple rants about this guy. He goes, I've never been so invested in a player so quick, invested in the outcome of their career so quickly as I have right now. (laughs) So thanks, Greg. You also like to troll me. That's fine. That dude, I can't wait to talk about it in our uh, in our live show tonight. But if you if you were sick and tired of my rants, right, about practice squad type players. 
or fringe type talents for the NFL? You better YouTube yourself some hold music here or fast forward the podcast about four and a half minutes because I'll tell you what, I'm going to grip it and rip it. (sighs) I am sick and tired of hearing about Zach Davidson. I'm tired of hearing about tight end Zach Davidson. Okay. And Chris, do you want to know where it all starts? Uh, Can I, let me, it's right there. You see that I'm looking at him like, you're telling me about somebody named Zach Davidson, who I see fifth on the tight end depth (laughs) chart, which to to me, fifth on the tight end depth chart, who gives a fuck? Here's, Here's what I'm telling you right now. Zach Davidson, the best thing that ever happened to him was Sal Capaccio noticed him. That's it. It's not the catches. It's not the collegiate career where he apparently set the world on fire. It's the fact that a bald guy with a goatee who has a microphone noticed him and decided to talk about him. Because as soon as Sal Capaccio. Did he tweet about him? He's tweeted about him leading to every other leech out there. Like, this is the problem. WGR gives these guys airtime. Sal Capaccio comes on and uses his to talk up Zach Davidson and says, oh, it's it's going to be hard to keep Zach Davidson off the roster. And then I see 50 other people who aren't in attendance and have no idea. They're just parroting the ideas of people that they see there on the sideline going, oh, yeah, you know, Zach Davidson. Oh, man, he's making a push for this roster. What do you know about it? What do you know about his push? Oh, quote, unquote, I'm putting air vicious air quotes around that to make the roster. What do you know about it? Oh, I, I, I hear he's catching a ball every day and he's making all these highlight real plays. Okay. Was, he, uh, was this on GR? It was on WGR, okay. and Sales talked about it. If you can't find it on his timeline, it doesn't matter. I haven't, I haven't seen any tweets. I did a thorough search here on Twitter. How about this? Chris, do you want me to handle this in 60 seconds rather than belaboring the points so we can get on with the show? <laughs> here I we mean, go. Here we go. This is the offense of Gable Stevenson. Lightning round. How? Okay, first of all. I'll give you his background. Excelled in D2. I'm reading it right here. Never played against top flight talent in college when he put all the tape together that everybody became enamored with. He's been in the league for three years. He's not a rookie. He's not a recently drafted guy who might have some untapped potential that no other team has gotten their hands on. He's been in the league for three seasons. He's also wearing a headband like he thinks he's Ralph Macchio. (laughs) <laughs> All these ridiculous physical tools, Chris. I mean, I mean, look at it. He's six foot what? Six foot seven? Six foot six and change? Uh, according to our lads, it's six four. No, six oh six point oh, four. I'm reading that incorrectly. Yeah, because it's it, our lads doesn't do that well. That's not your fault. Normally, Chris, you know I would tomahawk dunk on you if you were being stupid. That's yeah. not your fault. Well, so, uh, so hang on, no, no, no. So, so let's do this real quick. I'm just saying, Zach he, Davidson. He went to Central Michigan. Who are you playing? Who are you playing? This is it. Who so are you, you playing? came from a, a do nothing, do nothing conference, right? And against do nothing competition, who don't make the NFL. You have all these elite physical traits that everyone says, well, he must translate really well to the NFL. Real quick, Chris, how many targets do you think he has in his career? Just guess. If you had to ballpark three years in the NFL, three years in the NFL, just give me a ballpark guess how many times an an NFL quarterback has attempted to throw him the ball in a game. I'm going to go with Dawson Knox collegiate numbers less than 15 targets. Zero. How many offensive snaps has he played, though? This would be easier if you said snaps. Yeah. How many snaps has he played on offense? But you use the term offensive. Yeah. I figured maybe he might have played on special teams somewhere. Like, oh, let's use him as a decoy on like a fake field goal or something. How many offensive snaps? Offensive snaps, I'm going to say he's played five. Zero. How many special teams 
or defensive snaps does he have to his credit? Two. Zero. You've been in the league for three years, and you're such an otherworldly talent that the Buffalo Bills need you on their 2024 roster, and you have no targets, and you have no snaps, and three different teams have given you a look. I can't, Chris. I can't. I, 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 Chris, here's one of the biggest knocks against him. One of the biggest knocks against him is that he lacks the physicality because he's long and thin, right? Being 6'6 and 251 doesn't do much for you. He lacks the physicality to block at an NFL level. He would be a downgrade from someone like Chase Claypool. The fa- Chris, do you know I have to wash the taste of that phrase out of my mouth? Do we need to give Claypool some... Uh, oh. Pop Popeye's biscuits. Because ah. Oh, I can't Clay, believe Claypool. I can't believe I just said something nice about Chase Claypool. God, I mean, he has- that's what this guy does to me. The Bills, like, look, look at it this way. Schematically, the Buffalo Bills do not have a tight end on the roster that can do what Dalton Kincaid does. Dalton Kincaid is a one of one. If you're trying to build depth at a position, the point is supposed to be that either each guy has a well-defined role or one guy has a similar enough skill set to the other player that you can backfill his position in case of injury. You can't do that here. Zach Davidson can't hold Dalton Kincaid's jock. And that's just the reality of things. So now what you're talking about doing, because you're, you you have this idea in your head of, oh, a tight end, and look, he's big, and he makes catches, and we can slap the TE label on him. Labels don't matter at this point. If you're trying to get to what the NFL is steering towards, which is positionless offense, you need to have guys who just float. You know, remember when the term tweener used to be a bad thing? Yes. Now, tweener on offense is actually a good thing. It's especially if you're talking about how the Buffalo Bills are going to build their offense and their scheme and their skill positions in 2024. Zach Davidson ain't it, right? Here's what I see. I'm looking at this now. If you kept three times, because Zach Davidson, what does he offer on special teams? Having never done it at the pro level, going into a season where you have, no, it's a complete dice roll as to what your special teams needs might be. Who is Trey McKitty? Because According to our lads, some guy who's ahead not gonna, of the depth chart. Some guy who's not going to be here. It doesn't matter. Neither of them matter. The reality is, is that the Buffalo Bills, I'm going to stand on business right now, and I'm saying it now. You would be better off as a football team saying, I'm going to make Dalton Kincaid my one, Dawson Knox my two, Quentin Morris plays special teams, and I'm going to have him active on game days. Because he is a core special teamer, but he's an ace at it. He's a freak athlete. In the meantime, rather than roster a fourth tight end, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take another wide receiver. You look at the bodies that we have. Well, what do you got? A, a Shavers, a Claypool, some uh, Hollins. If he was, I think Hollins is pretty safe, but anybody with size who's an extra body you can throw in there. Because realistically, if something were to happen to Dalton Kincaid, you would need to find a big bodied pass catcher that you can put in the slot, but also kind of line up as a flanker and not have to change your entire offense to fit the fact that you lost one of the most dynamic pieces of it just by default to the fact that he's a matchup problem for the other team schematically. So with that said, Zach Davidson I will see you in hell and I'm tired of this discourse. I can't wait for him to get cut. That's the problem. It's not him. He didn't do it. It's all of you. It's all of you who make me root against that guy. And it's not his fault. And realistically, it's probably inevitable, right? I mean, he's a fifth on the depth chart (sighs) at tight end. You're not making the team. (laughs) And then also... I think we all need Slobber Knocker of the Week t-shirts, don't we? Sure. What do we, we need? Jim Ross t-shirts? I think, I think 26 shirts needs to be on this as soon as possible. And that leads me to one of my points tonight. 
Bobby Babich, one of the bigger takeaways from this week was Bobby Babich being talked about as the play caller for 2024. And yesterday I saw a funny headline on Pro Football Talk. It was Ken Dorsey. <laughs> he was quoted as saying, Ken Dorsey on not calling plays for the Browns. I just want to win. <laughs> then why'd you sign with Cleveland? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Chris, friend of the show, Brett Coleman. Yes. DJ Snyder. Yes. Bootleg. Bootleg football podcast. They do a team by team by team breakdown of the entire NFL every offseason. It's a it's a it's fan, their best work. It's a fantastic series. I watch th- every team I hate, teams I like. I watch their shows, and you learn so much about them. And Brett and EJ are just good, right? Like they're just good at what they do. Oh yeah, they're entertaining as hell. They described the Browns as a Ferrari with square wheels. <laughs> And it's one of the funniest things I've ever heard, but it's painfully accurate. It's like, guys, you could be so good, and yet there's just enough clunky, shitty pieces of your team that you're not going to be. Like, that's just, that's the unfortunate nature of things. I would I would have just said they were uh, a Ferrari with Kelly Titer. When you go to a, like, Monroe Muffler, and they're like, oh, Kelly Tires. And then if you know anything about tires, you go to TireRack.com to look at the rating. And TireRack.com has no idea what Kelly tires are. <laughs> They're just, it, it's like going to Sam, like, I got a Ferrari. I'm going to go buy my tires at Sam's Club. <laughs> so I, I I walked away from that and I started thinking about Bobby Babich and just the conversation that he's going to potentially not potentially likely be calling the plays and that the evolution of this seems to be on track. And I don't know. It's interesting. I think if you look at what drives coaches, right? Certain coaches, specifically those who have NFL tenure to take certain jobs. So I kind of went down the list here. If I can just look at this. So first of all, Ken Dorsey claims that he took the Cleveland job because he wants to be a winner. Regardless of their actual win-loss totals and lack of postseason success and lack of respect around the NFL, and then he's just happy to be along for the ride, I think the reality is he knew that his image was so tarnished. There was no, Chris, no team is picking him up out of the ashes of that firing and immediately installing him as a play caller. No. So I think he took the best job with a guy who he thought he could learn from. And there's no shame in that. Well, I think you also, if if you're a failed offensive coordinator in the way Ken Dorsey is, one of the things that you look for in a job is the same reason why we saw Doug Marone go to Jacksonville. Well, that's because, funny you say that. Because here's an in, I got an in <laughs> where I could be head, this guy might be on the hot seat. I got an in at being a head coach. And that's why I took this job. It's funny you say that because he's next on my list. But I want to point out, Kellen Moore also interviewed with the Browns before they hired Dorsey. And Kellen Moore said, nah, and just went to the Eagles, a team that actually wins, like a team that actually wins football games. And has a offensive head coach. Who well, can- no, I'm going to say poor structure. Because well, if you look in, in the way that Doug Peterson left that job. True, he won a he, Super Bowl. Yeah, he won a Super Bowl, but... I think I fired owner, two years later. The ownership of the Eagles will not hesitate to move on from somebody. Sure. Because I think Peterson was two years removed from the Super Bowl when he got fired. Mm-hmm. So as a Kellen Moore, I'm going to sign with the Eagles because I might have an in if if they... If the start, offense if they, does well and well, we no, still get if they start fired. if the Eagles start out this season the way they closed last season, Sirianni's gonna be on the hot seat. Kellen Moore might have himself an interim head coaching position. And that's kind of like what Doug Marone did. Doug Marone lined himself up with that baloney eating son of a bitch. 
He went down to the Jaguars to work for Gus Bradley, a head coach who, like, like. He was awful as a head well, coach. For, he was awful as a head coach. And Marone goes, I'll be your offensive line coach, but only with the title of assistant coach. And it literally put him in position to usurp that guy's throne. No, like he signed up smelling weakness. He smelled the blood in the water, took that job, took the assistant head coach label, knowing he'd be next man up when, not if, but when. Like Gus Bradley getting fired is the least surprising thing since we all found out Chris went to private school. <laughs> So when you look at our Bobby Babbage, like, I don't know, even though Sean McDermott spent the offseason being coy about who was going to play calls and what his role was going to be, he had to be given some sign that he wasn't going to get thrown into the same neutered boat as Ken Dorsey. I know because I'm looking at this chart that I prepared, Chris. It was he. what we're looking at here, guys, for those of you just audio only, you should be checking it out on YouTube, but. We're looking at a chart of all the new defensive coordinator hires in the 2024 cycle. Outlined in pink there are all of the teams that showed interest in Bobby Babbage. Obviously, he stayed with the Buffalo Bills. And it's interesting because the Buffalo Bills had a guy in-house named Eric Washington who went to another team. They never even interviewed Eric Washington. They let him leave and go become the core defensive coordinator for the Chicago Bears with a caveat. Matt Eberflus, the head coach, is their defensive coordinator. It's already been announced. Eberflus is going to maintain play calling duties this season. He's not giving them to Washington. So when you look at where those teams stacked up, first of all, Chris, just based on the 2023 defensive rank, Who's the only team that was close to where Buffalo finished? The Ravens? No, I mean the ones that were highlighted that had interest in Babbage. Oh, the Dolphins, Anthony Weaver. They inter well, they interviewed Bobby Babbage three times. Three times the Bills let him interview with the Dolphins. Interconference. Like interconference. Interdivisional. Interdivision. And yet, he signed with Buffalo. Why do you think that is? Uh, there's probably a caveat that McDermott was like, you'll call plays. I can't let... There's a thing with Babbage getting interviewed by Miami three times. You can't let Babbage go to Miami. Washington, out of, con out of conference, yeah, go to the NFC. And Washington... He took a job where he's not going to call plays. Why, Why let him interview at all then? Yeah. So here's, I think, what it came down to. They wanted him to see what it's like on the other side. They're like, hey, do you want who do you want to be with? So in this chart, folks, for those, those of you listening, 2023 defensive rank, I just kind of listed them. Where did these defenses finish last year? It's interesting. The Giants were one of the worst defenses in football. I'm not shocked he didn't take that job. Because I think everyone there is going to get fired here shortly, right? I don't, that I don't know. But I can understand why Bobby Babbage gets an interview with the Giants because it's Joe Shane, mm -hmm. Brian Dayball. They know him and all of that, non, all of that nonsense. But meanwhile, it's, Sean, better, it's better to just stay in Buffalo. Meanwhile, Sean McDermott let him go watch and say, hey, look, is the grass greener on the other side? Go look. Now, I'll bring you along slowly. I'm not going to promise you anything, but go look, because the Dolphins will give – their coach has no idea what the hell he's doing on defense. That's why we whip their ass every time we play him. It's why they hired Vic Fangio and then uh, to a multi-year deal and then fired him immediately. They have I no idea – let him walk to Philadelphia. They have no idea what the hell he's doing. Like, their coach doesn't understand defense. Go see what it is. See what kind of pressure they're going to put on you, and then take a look at what I've built, and do you want to continue – it's like that thing of the father – Looking at a son going, sure, you can strike out on your own when you're 15. You want to go live on your own, kid? Go try. Run away from home. But maybe things are pretty sweet here. You, It might actually be good for you to stick around for another year or two, learn some things, and then strike out on your own if you have to. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like that's kind of what happened here. 
because he went there, he interviewed three times, and even though, you know, defensively in terms of where they were ranked, the Bills and Dolphins were close, but Chris, watching those, he, he had a front, Babbage had a front row seat to how we schooled them when we played them, right? Yes. Do you think he wants to go play there and have to deal with that twice a year? I mean, if you go to Miami, it's strictly for state income tax. <laughs> Or you're just old. Or you're just old. So with that said, I like the announcement that he's going to be in the box. And it very much sounds like them tipping their hand is saying like, hey, you can go out there and start telling people you're going to be the play caller. We think you've earned it. And I like that. I do. Although, like, when you think about some of the commentary about how he has maybe too much emotion, like, he was joking. He's like, I get a little bit too fired up on the sidelines. That's why I'm going to be up in the box. Chris, do, what do, are you willing to put money on there being another, like, remember when Dorsey lost his mind and it became a gif in the press box against Miami? Oh, yeah. Classic. How many, how many, uh, how many Babbage gifts do you think we're going to get by the end of the year? I mean, we could have several with him pulling on his gold chain like he just picked up a Tonawanda 6 at Caputi's. <laughs> He's just pulling on his gold. I don't even know if you're allowed as a coach if you're allowed to wear a gold chain on the sideline, but I'm sure Bobby Babbage is going to try well, with I'm, his Caputi's attire so I'm on not the shocked, sideline. Well, so I'm not shocked that he's here. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about now, but also if you've listened to our live show already, you've heard a lot of it. His play call style, a lot of the people who were there for practice have talked, and I'm interested to get to see it with my own two eyes, about how the front seven, specifically the linebackers, are more aggressive. And I think that that's going to be a, a huge piece of what the Buffalo Bills have to be this year because of the state of the roster. I mean, by his own admission, this is a team that's looking for answers still at the safety position, and they're looking for guys to step up. And they're looking for these young guys to become players and reliable players for them inside this system. And he admitted that it's tough to replace all that pre-snap communication that they've been relying on for all these years. Now, again, I have to urge you, if you haven't heard the other show where I talk about some of the pressure statistics year over year and some of the co- some of the causes I, I believe in for that being what it is and why I'm so interested to see where he takes it, please go listen to the other pod. But you might need a more aggressive approach than we're used to, or at least have gotten used to over the last few years. If you're going to help get those the, the guys on the back end acclimated, comfortable, and up to speed and still be successful given our schedule. Part of that has to do with the A and B gap blitzing and what it means for the linebackers. Like, he really attacks that. And I think that it's going to be necessary because there hasn't been any mention of Casey Tuhill. When did, when, have you heard the name Tuhill at all? Went to work this morning. Just by uh, choice, I put on GR. And they mentioned Tuhill. How? Uh, could make the roster. Based didn't, on what? Didn't sound confident. In no. It. Just like Javon Solomon, you've got guys that they're pounding the table going, he could make it. Could. Great. What about Will? Because it doesn't sound like anybody's mentioning Smoot, which is a good thing, because that means he's just doing what he's supposed to do. And he's a veteran. He knows this is just camp. This is formality. I'm saving it. I, man, I don't know. I think that we're going to need him. And I think that considering the abilities of our linebackers, that A and B gap blitzing is going to be so important. Like Bernard was fifth on the team in pressures and third on the team in sacks in 2023. That's that's Terrell Bernard in his first season. Matt Milano tied for seventh in sacks and pressures back in 2022 when he last played a full year. But he had the third most quarterback hits on the team. Dorian Williams has looked really good filling in for Matt Milano, a weak side linebacker. And even though he's still better at the run than he ever will be in pass coverage, or maybe not ever, but at this point in his career, it's still nice to know, Chris, that we're not looking at a, like, when you think about the linebacker depth chart and all the names that they brought in and all the NFL experience, Dorian Williams is still the next guy up when they need somebody to come in for Matt Milano. 
You know, it's not Nick Morrow. It's not, although he's been hurt. It's not any of these other guys with NFL experience. It's literally, hey, this guy we drafted is coming on. He's coming along. That's that's what you need, considering everything we've invested into this position. Now, I had thought about having a whole conversation about a breakout for Terrell Bernard. But honestly, what I want to get to is one of the cruxes of the show tonight as we close this out. The up and down stocks of our defensive backs. There's some surprising names in here. The first one whose stock is rising is Cam Lewis. That's not a person I expected to come away with being enamored with at this point in training camp. And I think a lot of people would agree. When we went out and we signed, you know, when we went out and signed Mike Edwards, and then we, you know, we re-signed Taylor Rapp to an extension. And now you've got DeMar Hamlin, and then you draft Cole Bishop. You go, oh, okay, so everyone's just going to stack up here at the top of the safety depth chart. Cam Lewis, I don't even know where he's going to be. He's sometimes a backup nickel. He's done this. He's done that. But, Chris, they've trusted him to play on game day, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, with that in mind, with all these injuries, he's been taking starter reps. That right there tells you the team trusts this guy. And all of a sudden, this whole race, or at least the safety competition that we thought we saw is kind of a mess because it's kind of underscoring, oh, wait, they put their trust somewhere that I didn't expect, or at least we didn't expect them to have to trust, and they do. And it seems like it's working, so I don't know why they would shy away from it. Cam Lewis. Chris, when's the last time a UB player played on the Buffalo Bills? Was that Tyree Jackson? But did he actually, like, suit up on game day? The dude played the preseason, didn't he? Or oh, he need... did. He did play in the preseason. preseason. I'm talking about in a regular season game. Uh, we're just waiting for the Bills to sign Khalil Mack. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Cam Lewis, like, I love it. I love the fact that he's doing better and it's paying dividends for the Buffalo Bills that they have that guy in the locker room that they can turn to and say, look, we know we're not paying you. Don. <laughs> can you please come in here and take these snaps, be at least respectable on the back end and in a pinch, come down and also be a back of nickel for us. I love it. I love his versatility. And I, I don't see a world in which he's left off the roster short of injury. Another guy who's getting opportunities because of this is Daquan Hardy. When I was at the blue and red scrimmage, I watched the Bills offense march down to the red zone and Daquan Hardy pull off one of the sickest one handed interceptions I've ever seen, much less from a rookie. Chris, it was one of those passes where I thought he was trying to knock it down and instead he just grabbed it and tucked it. He's made multiple interceptions in training camp for being such a small cornerback he's already proven that he's got coverage chops he's got some versatility they're doing some different things with him positionally and i think that that versatility combined with his special teams potential is going to be huge for him entering the preseason because it's going to get him a lot of snaps and that's i think what he needs because our defensive back room is I don't want to say loaded because there aren't a lot of household names in it, especially not after we lost. You know, I shouldn't say lost. We divested of Trey White. Lost makes it sound like Chris, like, oh, he chose to spurn us for another team or, oh, he got hurt and he's not here. We divested from Trey White. And so we have what we have now. It was picked. And. I think that for him to start making up some of that depth that we didn't think we would have, he's going to have to have a strong preseason, but he's already showing that he's got a lot of chops. And I love the fact that they're giving him real coverage opportunities. When I thought that he was picked in the, what, Chris, I think it was the last of their fifth round picks or later in the fifth round. I know Javon Solomon was in there. Guys, call in if you know. Where late in the draft to Quan Hardy? I think it might have even been the sixth round. 
What I do know is that I thought he was just a token returner, and that was it. Like, okay, if if he stinks at that, he's going to get cut, and that'll be the end of it. There's Sixth a, round. There's a real chance that they see him as a viable depth option at defensive back if he has a strong enough camp in the preseason. And it sounds like it's he's flirting with getting more opportunities. So I'm going to be really interested to see what they do with him come the preseason. And then there's Kyer Elam, who just is shooting up everybody's boards. He's been rotating with Christian Benford. And I like it because it's the thing that you had. Chris, do you remember? It started out, it was Levi Wallace. Back in 2020, Levi Wallace was a starting cornerback for the Buffalo Bills. And then you had this thing of, well, okay, well, we've got Levi Wallace, but we've also got Dane Jackson. Well, we can rotate them and we can figure out who needs what and where their best positions are and who we should have. And and ultimately, Dane Jackson then had to take a back seat because we drafted more guys and more guys became acclimated. And we grew our defensive back room to a point where we no longer needed either one of those guys. I think a lot of the, what's happening right now, this rotation you're watching between Benford and Elam, and both of them making plays. I mean, if anything, I'm excited. I'm almost more excited, and I know this sounds stupid because we're still in the preseason for 2024, but I'm more excited about 2025. Because if this new coaching, you know, Jaleel Day, a former safety, comes in and starts coaching up Elam in a different way than the previous defensive backs coach had. Whatever the whatever the differentiation between the aggressiveness of Bobby Babich's play calling and just the new coaching of this position coach, it's checking all the right boxes and Elam looks the best he's ever looked. And that's a good problem to have when you say, Chris, this is a matchup driven league. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we were sitting here with Anthony Prohaska, and I was saying one of the big things that the Ravens had to their advantage when they were making their playoff run against the Bills in 2020, and we met in the divisional round, and we beat them in a really crappy game, low scoring, because both defenses were just, just stymieing the other offenses, is that the Ravens had three cornerbacks across the field who were all 5'11", 6 foot, and either could play a good cover man cover game or just a strong press game and then just matched well. So the, they could put giant cornerbacks on full size. You know, Teron Johnson, we all love him. He's small. But if you could, if you threw a dime look, they had guys who could line up. They had a, just battleships at cornerback. The Bills are flirting with the same thing here. And I think it's gorgeous. I think that there's teams that would love nothing more than to try to spread the bills out this year because they know that our defensive line probably doesn't have maybe the pass rush chops that it did last year, which is still to be seen. I think they I think they have potential depending on what Miller does. But I think that there's a thought that, hey, we can thrive if we can spread these guys out and take advantage of mismatches. Well, what if we have a Kyrie Elam? who we can line up and just let physically battle it out with some of your other receivers, some of your lesser talents. We can just have him man break. We can have him press at the line if you have a big tight end, a la the Kansas City Chiefs. I think it opens a lot of doors for you, schematically, as far as what you can get away with. And also, in terms of an injury, it gives you some like real insurance. And all of this, is just based on the ascension of one player and the work that he's put in this offseason. There is one player I'm worried about, right? If you want to talk about stock being down, and it kind of throws the whole room into a lurch, it's Taylor Rapp. I'm reading a report from Joe Biscaglia, and he's talking about how, you know, the Bills' faith in Taylor Rapp is being tested because he's still showing a lot of the inconsistency that he showed last year and that, you know, he, they, they don't always, he, he sometimes over pursues. He's a little over aggressive. He's sometimes a little overly physical, which will get you flagged. He's doing some things that I think they would have liked to have seen ironed out of his game by now. And now there's some growing concern that 
Like he was the one guy penciled in as we at least have this guy who knows our system and can play safety in it. And now maybe we were wrong. I'd argue that Hamlin having a good camp kind of mitigates some of that because you're not going to need to trust. You're not going to need to trust rap in that capacity. And I think having Cam Lewis helps in that capacity because if rap just can't do full-time safety all the time on the field, then you have bodies that you can throw at this problem. But it does give you pause about what's going to happen to this football team because, Chris, the first month of our schedule is grueling. Cardinals, Dolphins, Jaguars, Go- Cardinal, Ravens, Ravens, Texans. Texans. I, m- I might have gotten uh, four out of six. I'll double check. Imagine having terrible safety play for those early stretch where you're like, well, Mike Edwards will come back eventually and he'll acclimate eventually. And Cole Bishop will eventually find his way to the football field. Nailed it. Yeah, you did. Cardinals, Dolphins, Jaguars, Ravens, Texans. It's nuts. If you start the season with terrible safety play, it could very well sink you. And so in that way, I'm looking at this saying, do they have to be a team? that has to keep their eye on that waiver wire. Now, Chris, if you want to take a look at, if you can pull up Spotrack free agent tracker and just take a look at who's out there and available on the market today. I've noticed an uptick in safeties coming off the market. Quandre Diggs got a deal. And then I think there was at least two other guys who signed in the last week and a half. Veterans who have been holding out for bigger pay and it just didn't materialize. We can know the Titans signed Jamal Adams. I think that, um, yeah, if you want to just move that over to safety. They're also potentially going to be a team that's going to have to watch the <laughs> cutdowns at the end of the season and see if anybody releases a guy they think they can work with. Because right now, the depth of the safety room is not only being tested in terms of injury, but it's also being shown that there's not... <sighs> They're like the ceiling for their existing talent, like might have been a gamble. They might have gambled and lost on this. Now, Chris, we've sat here and said this how many times, which is why I give pause and I'm willing to trust Brandon Bean. How many times have we remember when we did a preseason show and we played the clip of and I remember doing like an almost like it was in jest, but a, a spit take. When we clipped it out of Brandon Bean's presser, when they asked him about not pursuing any of the veteran linebackers, and he was like, no, I just, I trust what we have, and I think Terrell Bernard's going to be a fine player. Mm-hmm. And I, and he mentioned Balin Specter, and I was like, Pfft. you said Balin Specter. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Wasn't the linebacker room, I mean, until injuries just ravaged it to the point where we were starting guys off off of RV trips. Wasn't the linebacker room okay? Yes. They certainly weren't the reason that we lost games last year. No. I wonder how much of this is just, again, recency bias. Remember a couple of weeks ago when I talked about how coming out of 2015, 2016, we had terrible safety play. And then we got Poyer and Hyde, and they were really, really good. And so I think we were spoiled. But teams win with average safety play, right? I can remember Sean McDermott starting a guy named Trey Elston. And I know that name because he was a guy out of Ole Miss that I thought would be a good NFL football player. I was like, there's no way he doesn't get drafted in the third, fourth round. Turns out he's an undrafted. This is how much I know. He's an undrafted free agent. And the Bills end up picking him up. And then he starts a game for us. A game. In fact, I'm going to Google it. Trey Elston Bills. Trey Elston, Trey Elston, Buffalo Bills. I never heard back. of the guy. Yeah, played one season for the Bills and the Eagles. Do, 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 do. Trey Elston pro football records. You can't even find his statistics. That's hilarious. Yeah, because he played one. He started one game. Is he Buffalo. like a. Uh, Look at this. One career game started. In Buffalo, New York, 
Do you know how many? Do you know how he played in his one? He he was thirteen games total, one start at safety. Makes sense. Look at this. If we go and look at his career, where was it? Game number, game number, game number. But 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 there we go. Buffalo against Oakland. He had eight solo tackles. <laughs> he had an interception. This is a undrafted free agent journeyman player. Came in that season, right? He was playing for Cleveland. He gets cut. Buffalo picks him up, sticks him on the practice squad. He comes, he or actually, yeah, practice squad. He hangs out. He finally joins the roster, comes into a game against Oakland, gets an interception, and piles up eight tackles. We have a defensive back friendly scheme. So for as much as I want to hand ring about Taylor Rapp's dissension, I give pause. I don't want to be panicky Pete. I say, Chris, we all take a deep breath and oh, goose fraba. It's okay if Taylor Rapp isn't great. I don't need great. What I need is decent. And the scheme, I think, takes care of a lot. I think that they've learned, I'd like to think that they've learned from that Jordan Poyer year where every game Poyer didn't play, we lost. Last year, Poyer was playing linebacker half the time. <laughs> he was down in the he was down in the box. They didn't trust him to be on the deep half anyway. So I think that we're gonna be fine schematically, and it's just gonna be a learning curve. The question is, can we sustain that through the early part of the season? And so ahead of the preseason, that's going to be something that we're all going to have to keep an eye on. Because if the safety room stinks on ice, which I have a hard time believing it will, considering it never has under Sean McDermott, then we might be in a lot of trouble. But with that said, I'm remaining optimistic as I sit my Montucky. Chris, this is it. Camp's going to break this week. We have a preseason game. For those of you who haven't already listened to our uh, show, previewing this preseason matchup and all the things we're looking for, make sure you go check it out. We've got a lot of interesting stuff in there about the <clears throat> pressure statistics of the Buffalo Bills and why we think Bobby Babich is a nice pick to kind of turn the tide on some of this. Just some snark. Are we a lot of snark. I'm off on weekends for all. Are we watching together? Is there? A, I don't think a, so. See, Chris, are you, are you, do you have family plans? I'm pool partying and literally taking my kids to ride horses. The days of the Bills preseason games. My children are going to ride horses. God. <laughs> I didn't I, I didn't realize I, your kids were auditioning for Brokeback Mountain. <laughs> On that note, guys, I think we're going to end the show. Thanks for showing up this week. Make sure you tune in next week as we'll have the recap of the preseason game. We'll gear up for the next one. We'll have some AFC's roundup where we'll get some uh, divisional opponents' opinions. But for tonight, we got to get the hell out of here. I'm Drew Gear. That's Chris Krueger. This has been your Rock Pile Report.